Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we have Jose, Jose Miguel Hernandez Lobato with us. Uh, he is a great expert on uh, probabilistic modeling, uh, Gaussian processes, uh, Bayesian neural networks, you name it. Uh, also Bayesian optimization, topic everybody here has to like. Um, and uh, he is currently university lecturer in machine learning at the University of Cambridge, so close by. Uh, but for well obvious reasons, uh, physical uh, seminars are still off. Uh, that's unfortunate, but hopefully that's going to change in the near future. Uh, he's also uh, affiliated with Alan Turing Institute, uh, and in the past he was uh, uh, he was a researcher at uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Harvard uh, with Professor Ryan Adams. Uh, and before that, with uh, again at, in Cambridge uh, with uh, Professor Gaharamani. Uh, I think I always mangled, uh, always mangled his uh, surname. Uh, apologies, whoever might know better. And uh, even before that, he did his uh, PhD uh, in Spain at uh, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And we are really happy to hear from him about probabilistic methods for increased robustness in machine learning. Uh, well, please uh, Good. go ahead. Good, thanks a lot for the introduction and for inviting me to give this seminar. Uh, you saw the topic is about the uh, probabilistic methods for increased robustness. And uh, I would like to start with some motivation. Uh, uh, we are all very aware of the successes that uh, deep learning has had in the last uh, uh, decade or so. And uh, uh, despite these successes, uh, there are still some limitations in deep learning methods. And uh, in particular, I'm going to focus here on uh, the problem that these methods uh, usually degrade catastrophically when you try to make predictions for inputs that are different from those seen at uh, training time. And in particular, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, two particular problems. Uh, the first one is the problem of confident extrapolation. Uh, neural networks uh, may uh, make uh, accurate predictions if you uh, feed them some input data that is very similar to the data that has been used to train those models. However, if you feed some uh, data that could be quite different, uh, and in this case, this is a toy problem, but if you start feeding to the network inputs that are, for example, on this right uh, side, you see that the output of the network can take uh, arbitrarily large uh, values. And uh, the networks, they don't really tell you anything. They just uh, give you some uh, point estimate for the prediction. And uh, this could be unreliably wrong, and you wouldn't know. Uh, so that can be problematic if you want to apply these methods in real world settings where this, this can actually happen. Uh, the second problem that I'm going to be focusing on is that of spurious dependencies present in the data. And this is illustrated in this example. Here we have a neural network that has been trained to classify images of uh, wolves and uh, huskies. Uh, and uh, what happens is that the images of the wolves, they all have uh, snow in the background. And uh, the classifier has uh, learned to uh, pick on this uh, dependence of the background pixels with the label of the image. And here you have the image, uh, sorry, <laughs> you have here the image of a dog and um, the, the dog, this is a husky, but it's classified as a wolf uh, because the, the background is, uh, is having this snow. And uh, when you look at the explanation that an, a method for interpretability gives you, you see that the classifier is focusing on, on this snow uh, to make predictions. Uh, this can result in problems if you then have to make predictions on new data where you have uh, these uh, images of animals and then the, the background uh, is different uh, or, or has different statistics. And ideally, you want to learn a robust predictors that would be focusing on uh, the shape of the animal and not really on these uh, uh, background pixels. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to describe different probabilistic methods uh, for machine learning that will be able to address these uh, limitations. For addressing the problem of confident extrapolation, we are going to use uh, Bayesian deep learning techniques uh, that will provide uh, reliable estimates uh, of uncertainty, especially for uh, inputs that are significantly different from, from uh, 
from those uh, seen at the training uh, at training time. We're going to focus on the data set uh, shift uh, problem. And we are, I'm going to present some of the best existing methods for solving this problem. Uh, obtaining these accurate estimates of uncertainty uh, is going to be challenging, especially on very large uh, neural networks. And this is a problem that we will be uh, addressing here, how to obtain accurate and scalable uh, approximate inference uh, with uh, deep neural networks. The second problem of spurious dependencies, uh, we're going to solve uh, this problem by uh, following a causal approach. We're going to use uh, deep generative models to learn latent variables that will explain the data. And then we're going to uh, look at those latent variables that are actually the causes of the target variable. Uh, and uh, those uh, will be uh, representing uh, the dependencies that actually generate the label in the data, and they are not going to be spurious like these background uh, pixels. So these causal latent variables will be uh, uh, generating the, the, the patterns in the data that actually uh, determine the shape of the animal and not the background pixels. The question is then, uh, how can we estimate and discover uh, which, uh, how, how can we estimate the latent variables and discover which ones are the causal ones? And I'm going to be describing this in detail. This causal approach is fundamentally different from uh, the, the, the approach followed by typical deep learning methods where you just have the input features shown here in green and you want to predict a target variable and you just look for associations between the input features and the label and some of these could be just uh, spurious, like maybe some of the input features are just uh, uh, the result of some selection bias based on the class label. And they're actually the effect of the class label and not the cause. And we wouldn't want to be building our predictions on those uh, spurious features that uh, are only the effect of the label and not the causes. Good. Uh, so this is more or less the roadmap for uh, today's talk. And uh, I'm going to start by giving a description of uh, the methods that will allow us to solve this problem of, uh, or to address this problem of confident extrapolation. Uh, in particular, I'm going to describe a method for Bayesian deep learning uh, called subnetwork inference that will allow us to obtain these uh, accurate estimates of uncertainty. And uh, this is some uh, work that has been uh, accepted uh, for presentation at the ICML this year. Uh, this is joint work with some of the PhD students and postdocs in my group, uh, Eric Taxberger, Eric Nalinski, Javier Antoran, and uh, James uh, Allenham. Um, uh, let's uh, start with some motivation for this uh, work. Uh, we are interested in obtaining estimates of uncertainty in our neural networks. So we are going to have some prior distribution on the weights. Uh, the neural network is going to specify some likelihood or probability for the output as a function of the inputs and the weights. And uh, when we multiply the two and normalize, we obtain a posterior distribution that can be used to make predictions. Uh, and this posterior distribution represents uh, our uncertainty on the model parameters. And this uncertainty in the model parameters will be also translated into uncertainty in the uh, predictions of the model. So we could uh, then uh, compute uh, an average of uh, predictions of an neural network with respect to this posterior to obtain estimates of uncertainty. Uh, this is in general quite challenging because uh, the weights in our neural network are uh, very large, the number of weights. This is a high dimensional distribution and there are also very complicated dependencies between the weights. Uh, people have worked on this before. For example, they have uh, tried to approximate the full posterior with a simpler distribution, in particular a distribution that assumes, for example, factorization across the weights because in general it's quite hard to uh, capture complicated dependencies between these uh, uh, weight values if you don't assume this factorization. The problem with this is that uh, the quality of the uncertainty estimates can be quite uh, poor if you do these uh, approximations. And uh, in this work, we focus on the following question. Uh, we have to do approximate inference on the posterior distribution, uh, or we have to approximate this posterior distribution over the weights. And the question is, do we really need to focus on uh, obtaining a posterior approximation on all the weights. Uh, could we actually work with uh, only a subset of the weights? Uh, and that might be enough to obtain good results. Uh, and the, the reason for this idea is that the neural networks are actually uh, over-parameterized 
And uh, it has been uh, verified in practice that you can actually remove many of their weights and the predictions are still uh, quite accurate. So now the question is, instead of really pruning weights or removing weights in our neural network, here we are going to uh, prune the uncertainty in our weights in a way that we are not going to consider uncertainty only on a subset of the weights. And maybe by only capturing uncertainty on that subset of weights, we may still be able to obtain a, an accurate estimate of the uncertainty of the whole network. Um, and the answer to this question, can a full deep neural networks model uncertainty be well preserved by just a small sub networks model uncertainty? And the answer uh, uh, to this question is yes. And we're going to see how, how to do this in practice. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt. Uh, good. So the approach that uh, yes. I, I have one question on your uh, previous slide. Yeah. Um, I understand the principle of, uh, of pruning and why, in general, it's not a problem. Uh, you just said earlier that you have strong correlations in between the weight. So isn't that getting in the way when you do pruning? Um, at least from the results that uh, we have found, it seems it's not so much. Uh, and uh, the reason is that uh, you may not have these strong correlations between all the weights and uh, only a subset of those. Uh, and maybe that's enough. Uh, obviously, if there are strong correlations between all the weights and all the weights, then that's going to be creating problems. Uh, but it might be that only some of the weights present these strong correlations. Okay, thanks. Good. So our method is called SAP network inference. And uh, it works as follows. The idea is that we have this posterior distribution for the weights. We're going to approximate it now with a, a posterior distribution that contains a deterministic component, which represents uh, some weights for which we don't capture any uncertainty. And then we're going to have some other weights on which we will be capturing uncertainty. So our, all, our whole set of weights is divided into a subset of weights for which we just uh, fix them to point estimates and we don't capture any uncertainty on those. And then uh, another set of weights on which we capture uncertainty. In the end, uh, our posterior approximation is going to be a product of these delta functions on the deterministic weights. Uh, centered at the, the point estimate for those weights. And then we have an, an approximation to the posterior distribution on the weights of the deterministic network. On the, on the, on the, sorry, on the SAP network on which we are going to do inference. Uh, when we put this into practice, there are several questions that we have to address. Uh, first, uh, how do we obtain this uh, approximation to the posterior distribution of the SAP network weights? The other question is, how do we fix the weights of the deterministic weights? Uh, and then uh, the other question is, how we actually select our subnetwork? Given uh, the original set of weights, how we are going to choose uh, a subset of weights on which we will be doing Bayesian inference and another subset on which we are not going to do any inference at all uh, and just work with their point estimates. So we will be addressing all these questions. Uh, to address the first one, uh, we need to do approximate inference. We need to approximate a posterior distribution on the SAP network with a more complicated distribution. And the idea here is that we are going to use the Laplace approximation. This was actually one of the first techniques that was proposed to do inference or Bayesian inference in neural networks. And the, the idea is very simple. You just find some point estimates of your weights. This can be the map solution. Uh, for the weights than the one that maximizes the log uh, posterior. You can easily find this uh, solution using some uh, numerical optimization method. And then once you have fixed this uh, value for the weights, you're going to, uh, I mean, this, this value of the weights will correspond to the mode on the posterior. No? So if this uh, curve shown here in orange is the true posterior, you find just some input that achieves the highest value of the posterior and then, uh, you are going to approximate the posterior with a Gaussian centered at that value uh, of the weights, which is shown here in red. Uh, the Gaussian has the same uh, mode as the, the map solution for the weights. And the next step is to choose the covariance matrix for your Gaussian. And uh, this is done typically 
by doing a second order approximation of the posterior. You take your log posterior, uh, you approximate that as a quadratic function, and that gives you the coefficients uh, of the covariance matrix in your Gaussian. No, the, the log of your Gaussian is a quadratic function, and it's going to have the same uh, coefficients as the second order approximation to the log of the posterior. This is the Laplace approximation. Many of you are probably familiar with this. Um, so in this uh, matrix here, H would be the Hessian of the posterior. It's just the matrix of second uh, order derivatives. Uh, and this would give you a correlated Gaussian approximation to the posterior. I have to say that in practice, you don't really use this Hessian. Uh, and you use uh, something called the Gauss-Newton approximation uh, to the Hessian. And the idea is that uh, the Hessian has some uh, problems when you work with uh, it in practice. Uh, for example, it may not be positive uh, uh, definite. Uh, and uh, the Gauss-Newton approximation, which is just obtained by taking the Jacobian of your neural network uh, loss with respect to the weights, you take the transpose of the Jacobian times uh, the Jacobian and then you have some uh, additional term coming from the prior. You will use this Gauss-Newton approximation because uh, it's found to work uh, uh, quite well in practice, and it avoids some so, some of the problems with the Hessian. So you could uh, think of using this. Uh, obviously, you cannot apply this method to your whole network because the Hessian uh, or this matrix here, or the approximation to the Hessian is going to be too high dimensional. No, it's going to have dimension the number of weights in your network is squared. That's too large in practice. Um, so you will have to do something uh, to apply this method to that uh, networks. Uh, the method is quite simple because it only requires you to just train your neural network in any way that you would normally do to find some point estimates of the weights. And then you just uh, obtain a Gaussian approximation around that point estimate. Um, to make it scalable, what we propose in this work is to apply this Laplace approximation only on a subset of the weights. Uh, the idea is that we're going to fix the remaining weights to their point estimates, and then we're going to uh, focus only on a subset of the weights. And the idea is that this uh, covariance matrix now will be only uh, for those weights uh, that uh, are selected in our subnetwork. And this is usually going to be a small number of weights. Uh, Miguel, do you have any intuition about what the true distribution it looks like, the one that you're uh, approximating with the Laplace? Like, is it, are they unimodal, the weights of these? Uh, sorry, no, distributions they of the are weights? multimodal. Uh, and this, this is well known that they, they are multimodal. They're multimodal because you have multiple symmetries in neural networks. Um, and uh, you know that. Uh, for example, uh, I mean, the neural networks have these uh, weight matrices, and uh, you could just uh, change the scales or uh, perform some linear transformations, and then the, the, the matrices, the, the output of the network is going to be the same. Uh, so there are multiple modes. Uh, however, we are doing this uh, single mode approximation. And then this is obviously something to think about. Is this really reasonable, what we are doing? Uh, the key thing is that the way you apply this uh, Laplace approximation in practice is that, uh, for example, when you make predictions, you don't really make predictions by sampling from uh, this Gaussian and then feeding the sampled weights into your uh, neural network and obtaining a, a prediction for, for Y. The way that you implement this in practice is that uh, you linearize the model to make predictions. And uh, what you do is you take the output of your neural network um, as a function of the weights, and you are going to linearize that. So you say, my, linear, my neural network is going to have uh, as output for a particular setting of the weights, just the, weight, the value that the neural network would give. And then I'm going to add to that the gradient of this output times uh, the value of the weights. So you do a first order linear approximation to the network. And what happens is that when you use this Gauss-Newton approximation, the covariance matrix that you obtain is the same as the posterior covariance matrix in this uh, linearized model. Uh, so what is happening is you are fitting your neural network. You are then approximating your neural network with a linear model 
uh, and then you are doing exact inference in that linear model. Uh, and actually, this works uh, very well in practice. Even though in the true posterior distribution for the neural network, uh, the posterior is highly multimodal and complicated, what happens is that this approximation is actually exact inference <laughs> in a linear model that approximates the, the neural network. And uh, that's why this, this is going to work uh, quite well in practice. Yeah, thank you. That's super clear. Thank you. Good. Uh, so given that we are going to use this Laplace approximation to, uh, to uh, compute the, the posterior distribution on the subnetwork weights, uh, we can then see how the whole uh, approach would work. Uh, and uh, this is how this subnetwork inference would work. You fit your neural network, you find point estimates of your weights. This could be used uh, doing any uh, numerical uh, optimization method that you already use for training neural networks. You choose some subset of weights. You are going then to capture uncertainty by having this multivariate Gaussian distribution, capturing the uncertainty of those weights. And then you are going to make predictions with the resulting model that contains some random weights, but some deterministic weights uh, as well. Uh, this allows us to answer some of the questions that I included before. Uh, how do we obtain the subnetwork posterior approximation? We use the Laplace approximation with a full covariance Gaussian. How do you how do we fit the fix the weights of the of, of those of those weights that uh, are deterministic? We just uh, leave them at their map estimates, you know, the same value that we found when we apply the Laplace approximation, we just fix them to those values. And then the next important question here is how do you choose the subnetwork weights? Uh, and this is a key problem. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you now how we do that in practice. Uh, this uh, is called the subnetwork selection. And the way we want to select our subnetwork is in the ideal setting, we want the uh, posterior distribution on the weights that results from working only with this subnetwork. Sub we want it to be as close as possible to the original uh, posterior distribution. And we are using here a distance between distributions called the Wasserstein distance. And then what we're going to do is to choose our uh, subnetwork by minimizing this uh, Wasserstein distance. So we can then replace the two posterior by its definition. Our subnetwork posterior is going to be our approximation, which is just the multivariate Gaussian distribution on the weights of the subnetwork. And then we have a product of delta functions on the deterministic weights. So this could be the resulting posterior distribution on the weights. So we have no uncertainty on a subset of the weights and then uncertainty on some weights, but uh, this is Gaussian. And uh, obviously we cannot work with the exact posterior. So what we are going to do here is to also use uh, a Gaussian approximation to the true posterior. Uh, we're going to use the uh, mean of this Gaussian to be the same as in the, in the Laplace approximation. So this is the point estimate of the weights that we found. And now the key thing is this covariance matrix here. Obviously, we cannot use a big covariance matrix because this would be intractable. Uh, so we wouldn't be able to even compute this huge covariance matrix. Uh, so what we are going to do to scale things is to assume a diagonal approximation on this uh, covariance matrix for the subnetwork selection step. So I said before that uh, methods that use a diagonal approximation in the covariance of your Gaussian, they, they don't work very well in practice. Uh, but here we are only using that approximation to choose our subnetwork. And then with the subnetwork, we will use a full covariance matrix. And this actually uh, works better in practice. This diagonal assumption for the subnetwork selection and then using a full correlated Gaussian on the subnetwork works much better than just uh, uh, assuming a diagonal approximation uh, when you try to fit this uh, whole factorized Gaussian to the posterior. Uh, so assuming that this uh, covariance matrix is diagonal, then you can actually solve for the subset of weights on which you have to do inference exactly. And there's an analytic solution for the subnetwork selection problem. Uh, you just need to choose uh, as your subnetwork those weights with largest marginal variances in this approximation. So you just have to look at this diagonal covariance matrix, choose those weights, for which you have a uh, highest uh, uncertainty. And then uh, those are the weights uh, that you choose for your subnetwork. So it would be the weights 
with largest uh, variance, uh, posterior variance, uh, according to this uh, diagonal covariance matrix. Um, and this is kind of intuitive. No? If you say, I have weights uh, that are kind of loose, they are not fully specified by the data, it makes sense that you choose the ones that are less specified by the data uh, as your uh, sub-network weights. I have a so, question about that. Yeah. Um, so um, wouldn't so I'm worried that you would select weights that have no influence on the output at all. Um, like yeah, shouldn't you require that, that could be one possibility. <laughs> yes. So this so this criteria seems to be at least slightly broken. Ideally, we um, want to have posterior variance, but you also wanted to have the posterior actually have an impact on what yeah, the function is doing. That's right. So if you think about it, uh, you can think about the problem that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, you have this uh, neural network that is making predictions on some data. Uh, maybe I can show the slide here. Uh, and it could be that some of the weights don't really have much effect on the on the uh, on the output of the network where you have the data. But maybe those are going to produce changes in other regions. Uh, and uh, that's uh, maybe those weights could be useful to capture uncertainty. Uh, so obviously, maybe those weights are loose because they don't affect much the predictive performance uh, in this region where you have the data. Uh, but maybe in other regions, they could. Uh, and maybe it's reasonable to include them. Uh, I mean, I don't say that this is the best way to choose the, your sub network. Uh, this seems to be something reasonable. And we found that it works well in practice. But uh, yeah, we don't have like a, a strong theoretical reason for just uh, choosing these weights with the largest marginal uh, variance. Okay, thanks. Good. Uh, so yeah, then the idea is that they uh, choose weights with large marginal variances. Uh, there are many ways in which you could uh, do that. Uh, obviously, you could use any other approximate inference method um, to, to, to find this marginal variance for the weights. Uh, what we found is that this method called diagonal swag uh, produces uh, very good results when we use it to choose our uh, sub-network. And it seems to be working better than, for example, variational inference or uh, a diagonal Laplace approximation. So we use this method to choose the sub-network. Um, um, so that's it. Uh, let's have a look at how this works in yeah. practice. Yes? Uh, do you have in practice some patterns in the subnetwork that you choose? Does it tend to be something that goes from uh, like end to end in the network? Is it more uncertainty is important within one specific layer? Yeah, I uh, I don't think we didn't. I, I think we didn't really spot anything significant. Um, and I think, for example, what we find is that usually the last layer is important. Uh, and I think there are many weights in the last layer, uh, but there are also weights in other layers. So it's not something that we would be able to say there is this clear pattern. Um, okay, thanks. Quick, quick question from, from the previous slide, please. Yeah. Um, have you by any chance considered trying to optimize the elbow uh, to find a subnetwork? Because then you're actually trying to minimize the, the KL between the, the approximate and the true posterior. Is that something you've You've considered, you've thought about, and maybe uh, so it's you, way more expensive. But. So you say, for example, uh, to fit this Gaussian uh, optimizing an elbow instead of using the, the Gauss-Newton approximation, for example? Find a subset, at least, like maybe uh, in a greedy fashion, so that you optimize the elbow, because then you're minimizing the cal between yeah. the, the approximate and the true posterior. Because, I mean, the, the posterior mm -hmm. you're picking here is, in a way, quite so restrictive, right? Yeah, we didn't really look into that. Uh, that will involve doing some, um, yeah, I think, so actually one of my students, yeah, so one of my students actually tried to numerically optimize this. And it actually works well. If you <laughs> if you think about uh, doing some, he, he didn't work with the elbow. He worked with uh, some networks on which you can obtain the, the full Gaussian approximation with correlations. And then he tried to find the sub network uh, and he had some uh, numerical methods that we do some search uh, on, on a subset of the weights. Uh, obviously, this, this thing only works when your diagonal is, is 
your covariance matrix is diagonal. So if you have correlations, the problem is more complicated. So he tried to do that and he, get, he got much better networks than using this approach, but uh, that's not scalable. Yeah, this is <laughs> uh, very cheap. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. yeah, so the advantage of this is that it's very cheap. So we can see how this works on a toy problem. Here, this is the some data, and here we have the predicted uh, uh, distribution that we have uh, with the full covariance matrix. This is with uh, 2,600 weights. And uh, we see that we have a wide uh, confidence bands far away from the observed data. Uh, you can see uh, the map solution here on the other extreme that is not capturing any uncertainty. Uh, you can see what you obtain with a diagonal approximation. I think this is the diagonal Laplace method and it's uh, underestimating uncertainty here quite significantly. You can also see what you obtain with uh, only capturing uncertainty in the last layer. And uh, this is the result here. And here we see some uh, results for the subnetwork inference when we use 50% of the weights, 3% of the weights, and 1% of the weights. And even with 1% of the weights, we are even better than the final layer uh, and the diagonal approximation, which is quite significant. And obviously, this does much better than choosing the subnetwork at random. We can see here that at random, uh, you don't have much uncertainty in these other regions uh, where there is no data. Uh, so this shows how it works in, a, in this toy problem. Uh, we can see how it works in more complicated settings. Here we have uh, much bigger networks uh, with about one, uh, 11, 11 million weights. And uh, we're going to choose the largest possible sub-network in this case, which is about uh, 42,000 weights. This is about 0.38% of the weights. Uh, we're going to compare with different baselines, uh, map estimation, diagonal Laplace, Monte Carlo dropout, deep ensembles, uh, SWAG, and uh, Bogen. Bogen is a, a form of variational inference uh, with a factorized uh, approximation. And here the setting is uh, uh, to make predictions under distribution shift. So we are going to uh, make predictions on uh, neural networks trained on MNIST and the uh, sidebar. And then we're going to make predictions on inputs that are slightly different from those uh, synapse training time. In particular, we're going to rotate the uh, images in this MNIST setting. The rotated digits are very different from those seen at training time, and the network is going to make uh, uh, wrong predictions in those settings. It's not going to be able to make a, a correct prediction. But uh, if you have high uncertainty, at least you'll be able to, to know that, that you don't know what, what you should be making. Uh, as a prediction. In corrupted sidebar, we are uh, corrupting the input uh, image with different uh, corruptions, uh, and we have different levels of corruption from uh, one to five levels. Uh, zero is not corrupted data. And then we are going to look at the predictive log likelihood on this data. The predictive log likelihood will tell us more or less how well the method is uh, uh, estimating uncertainty in this setting. If the uh, uncertainty is low in these regimes where there is like a significant uh, amount of rotation, all the prediction, all the models are going to be make wrong predictions. They are going to make, in, they are making predictions on data that is very different from the training set. It's going to be clearly wrong the prediction, but if you are uncertain, then obviously you will be doing better than if you have like a very confident wrong prediction. And what we see here, this is the, the predictive uh, test log likelihood, higher is better. You see that uh, at the beginning is quite high because this is the, the same uh, data as in, at training time. And as you increase the amount of rotation, uh, things deteriorate. And what we find is that our method seems to be more robust than other baselines. Uh, the variation approach here, it's making uh, very good, uh, it's obtaining good results, but this seems to be only by chance because in Cypher, uh, this method also performs uh, quite poorly. I think this, is, this has been found before that uh, this variational method seems to be working well on MNIST, but in other data sets, it doesn't perform uh, so well. And in, in corrupted sidebar, uh, we are able to perform uh, even better than uh, these uh, deep ensembles, which are state-of-the-art techniques for, for uh, uncertainty under this distribution shift uh, setting. Uh, good. Uh, so this concludes this uh, first part of the talk. And uh, the take home message here is that I have presented this uh, linearized Laplace subnetwork inference method. It can be cheaply, easily applied to any post hoc uh, 
uh, it can be easily applied post hoc to any pre-trained model. So you just train your model in any way that you want, and you can obtain a certain estimates using this method. It seems to be more accurate than crude approximations or the full network weights. It can apply to large neural networks without sacrificing much its quality, and uh, it can outperform some of the best existing methods uh, for uncertainty quantification. Um, Good. Uh, so this concludes this first part of the talk. Uh, and uh, I don't know if there are any questions on this part. Uh, if not, I can move to the next one. It's good. Good. Uh, so let's talk about this one. Uh, this is some recent work. Uh, it's about avoiding these spurious dependencies. Uh, and uh, what we propose is a method called invariant causal representation learning, or ICAL. And this is. <laughs> This name comes is in honor of it in uh, to Carl Rasmussen. <laughs> uh, we we called it before just the uh, ICRL, but uh, it was too similar to the conference I clear, so we decided to call it the uh, ICAL. Uh, good. Uh, so let's see how uh, this works. Uh, this is some joint work with uh, Charles Chaudou, who is uh, one of my PC students, uh, Yuhai Wu and uh, Bernard uh, Shokov. Uh, so the problem we are addressing here is the one that I mentioned before. We have some spurious dependencies uh, in the training data. Uh, we saw the example of the huskies and the wolves that the classifier is picking up on the uh, background pixels. And uh, this has been shown also in some other settings. For example, if you in, in other settings, you can also see it. If you are classifying cows uh, with respect to other animals, those cows may happen to be more on a grassy fields and uh, uh, a neural network trained on uh, image data may be phased to classify a cow when it's in a bit. Um, so our goal is to avoid uh, this type of spurious uh, dependencies uh, that our classifiers pick up on those uh, because then performance could deteriorate quite a lot on test data when those dependencies don't happen to be there. Um, so how can we avoid those? Uh, it turns out that there is a method called invariant risks minimization that uh, solves this problem. Uh, and it works by considering data from different environments. These are different data sets that present these spurious dependencies. For example, you could have data about cows and most of them could appear in a, a green field. So the background could be green in most of these images. But uh, the statistics in the data are going to change slightly across data sets. So it might be that the frequency of uh, cows in green fields changes across these environments. And invariant risk minimization exploits this to obtain a classifier that actually uh, works by looking at the shape of the animal. And the idea is that the spurious dependencies between the background and the target are going to change across these environments. But the true causal features, the shape of the animal that uh, cause the label in the image, exhibit some constant dependencies with the target. And the idea in invariant risk minimization is to find some data representation that will induce a stable classifier that works well across uh, environments. Uh, if you have a classifier that builds on the spurious dependencies, the performance of that classifier is going to change across these environments, uh, and you want to avoid that. So this method works uh, to solve this problem partially because first it only works with linear classifiers, and ideally you may want uh, linear data representations and uh, sorry non linear data representations and non linear classifiers, uh, because it could be that the true target variable is a non linear uh, uh, function of the of the data representation, uh, and also the theory that guarantees generalization of this method to new environments. Uh, requires linear data representations. And uh, our method that I'm going to describe doesn't have this uh, limitation. Uh, so this is also interesting. This method, uh, invariant risk minimization, has some theoretical results. And the method that I'm going to describe also has similar that guarantee that you will be able to perform optimally on new environments that you haven't seen uh, before, uh, providing that you have infinite data on only a subset of the environments. Uh, so let's have a look at how this uh, ICAL method works. The idea is that we're going to uh, solve the problem by actually estimating the true latent variables that cause the target. So you can imagine that you have these input features and some target variable. This is data 
uh, across different environments, you could then estimate data and variables that actually were used to generate the data. And these data and variables for the images of the animals could be, for example, the shape of your animal, the color of the animal, the background, uh, the type of background in the picture, the color of the background, and so on. We are going to estimate those data and variables. Then we are going to do some causal discovery step where we are going to identify those data and variables that are actually the true causes of the label. And there are going to be other data and variables that are going to be effects of the label. This could be, for example, the background pixels. The data and variable that determines the background pixels could be just a result of a selection bias that is determined by the label in the images. And uh, to build our predictors, we are going to use only uh, the data and variables that are the causes of the target. We are going to estimate uh, the value of those data and variables. We are going to fit predictors of those data and variables. And then we're going to predict from those data and variables the target. And the combination of these uh, steps of predicting the causal data and variables and predicting then the label from those causal data and variables will result into a classifier that is going to be robust to the spurious dependencies. In particular, we want to be using these pixels that are the result of some of these uh, uh, causal data and variable, some data and variables that are caused by the target. So to put this into practice, the question is, how can we guarantee that we identify the true latent variables that we are used to generate the data? This is an important question. <laughs> and then the second is, how can we discover which ones are the causal latent variables? And I'm going to tell you now how to solve this problem. Uh, before doing anything, we need to have some assumptions. And we are going to have the following model uh, assumed uh, as the generator of the data. We assume that the data is generated by this model. We have the environment variable, some index that determines uh, on which environment you are. And then we are going to assume that that environment variable determines the uh, distribution of some uh, latent variables that will be causes of Y. And then some other latent variables that will be effects of Y. Uh, and here there are no connections between causal between latent variables. So there are connections between environment and latent variable and between latent variable and the target, but there are no connections between them. Uh, the latent variables also determine the distribution of the observed uh, features, which would be the pixels in the image. And these arrows, they are shown with the uh, dash lines because it could be that they are uh, edges or not in this model. So you could have some latent variables that don't change across environments, for example. Or you could have some latent variables that don't really cause the label or are not effects of the label. They could be just uh, representing noise. So we are going to assume this model. And uh, you could then obtain a conditional prior on the latent variables, given the environment and the label Y. Uh, and this uh, conditional distribution, we know that it factorizes across latent variables that are the effect of the label, because if you condition on the environment and on Y, the distribution over this uh, variable factorizes. So we have this product here. This is a product of factors that are correspond to the uh, latent variables that are effects. And what is, inter what is interesting is that when you condition on Y, which is the effect, uh, sorry, the target variable, we have some dependence between the causal latent variables. We are going to have that the probability distribution of the causal latent variables given the environment and the label uh, is going to not factorize in general. And this is well known. I mean, this is a, you could say that Y here is a collider of the causal latent variables and conditioning on the collider is going to introduce dependencies. So this, this conditional prior uh, does not factorize across the causal latent variables. Good, so this is the model that we are going to use. It's actually a latent variable model, and we are going to use neural networks to describe all the different connections here. Uh, so it's going to be a form of a deep generative model. With the fact that we have this conditional prior here that depends on Y and E. And what is extremely interesting, and this is a, an amazing result, is that in this model, you can guarantee that you will be able to identify the true latent variables that generated the data when this conditional prior that I show here belongs to a, a exponential family distribution. And uh, 
In fact, uh, what we do in this work, we extend some uh, theory from identifiable DAEs, which says that in a variational autoencoder model, if uh, the prior, if you condition on some auxiliary variables, which could be Y and E in this setting, but if you use a factorized exponential distribution as your conditional prior, you will have identifiability guarantees. You will be able to recover the true latent variables that were used to generate the data. And uh, in this work, we extend those results to a non-factorized exponential family distribution, which allows us to handle this setting where you have correlations between some of the data and variables. Um, so you can then estimate this model in the same way as you estimate a variational autoencoder model. The only difference is that your prior is now conditional on some observed variables. And you estimate this using a combination of variational inference and score matching. You need a score matching because this prior is a, an exponential family distribution. And in general, the sufficient statistics here yeah, of this distribution uh, are arbitrary. And we just obtain them by as the output of a deep neural network. Uh, so this means that we can have here arbitrary complicated distributions. And uh, we cannot normalize those, and we need to use a score matching to, to train those. But it's, uh, it's still doable. I won't go into the details of that. The idea is that we can identify the latent variables. And I will show you here how you can actually do this. This shows an example here. Um, we have this simple model that generates the data. There are four environments. And here we have one color for each environment, uh, yellow, blue, green, and uh, red. And we have now samples from the latent variables for each environment shown in the corresponding colors. We observe some label Y, which is just a linear combination of the latent variables. And obviously conditioning on Y is going to introduce dependencies between X1 and X2, no? Because if you fix Y, then if X1 is large, then X2 has to be small and the other way. Uh, so we see here the original latent variables. And we see here in this plot E, the reconstruction that we obtained with our model we actually identify the right latent variables up to simple transformations, like changes uh, in the mean and variance of those latent variables that are, are very simple. Uh, so we actually have identifiability guarantees up to permutation of the variables and some simple linear transformations of the uh, sufficient statistics of those variables. We see that the original variational autoencoder model doesn't work here. It will give you arbitrary latent variables each time you train this model and they could be completely overlapping as in this example. And the, the identifiable VAE that assumes a factorized prior also doesn't work as well as our method in this setting because it's making the wrong modeling assumption. And this is another alternative model for identifiability that also performs similarly as the VAE model. Uh, so this shows that we can identify the right latent variables now, the key question is, how do you know which ones of your latent variables are the ones causing the label? And uh, the idea here is that for any two latent variables in your model, you could have that both are causes of the target. One is a cause and the other one is an effect, or both are effects. Uh, and as it turns out, if you condition on E and Y, in this case, uh, the distribution of the latent variables factorizes. So these are independent given E and Y. The same happens here. If you condition on E and Y, X, Y, and X, Y are independent. And only when both are causes, you have that in general, when you condition on E and Y, they will be dependent because of this collider effect that Y is a collider and you are co conditioning on, on Y. Uh, so this gives us a hint on how to identify the true causal latent variables. You just look at pairs of latent variables. You apply a conditional independent test given Y and E. And if there are dependencies between those latent variables, they will be both causes. And if you have a pair of variables for which there are no uh, dependencies, they will be most likely uh, either is one an effect on a cause or both are effects. So this gives you a way to identify causal latent variables. Uh, there are some uh, corner cases on which maybe uh, uh, one of the latent variables is just a deterministic transformation of, uh, of Y. And in that case, uh, because you are conditioning on Y, you will always have independence. So this is not going to work in practice. 
but uh, there are methods that you could use to address that case, such as this method that works for uh, discovering causal associations with deterministic transformations. Uh, yeah, and if uh, you don't have a deterministic transformation, but there is only a single causal latent variable, there are ways in which you can also identify that. And I, I won't get much into the details of this, but uh, it can be found in the in the paper. So let's see how this works. Uh, you uh, have identified the, uh, you have estimated the causal, the, the latent variables, and then you have identified which ones are causal ones. And then you just obtain a causal predictor by just looking at your data, uh, sampling from the posterior distribution of the causal latent variables, and then fitting a predictor from the pixels to the latent causal to the causal latent variable values. And then you fit another predictor from those uh, causal latent variables into the target. And then you can concatenate the, the predictor for these two steps, predicting first the causal latent variables and then predicting the, the target. Uh, and then you obtain a, a predictor that is going to be robust to those spurious features. In particular, this latent variable here is an effect of the target, and we are not using that latent variable in our predictor, and we are not using those features that affect that uh, latent variable. So how does this work in practice? Uh, we tested this on a benchmark that is commonly used uh, within this setting. Uh, it was proposed in this uh, invariant risk minimization paper. Uh, it's the colored MNIST uh, problem. You have to predict uh, whether the digit belongs to this uh, group of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or this other group of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, so you have the label Y. It determines on which category the digit belongs to. But there is some noise in the labels. It can be flipped with probability 0.25. And uh, to introduce some of these spurious dependencies, you have that the digits are colored uh, according to the class label. So you look at the class label, and then uh, there is going to be some color, uh, and uh, there is going to be some uh, probability that there is an agreement between the, the class label and the color. So uh, with probability 1 minus p, you have uh, the same color, uh, the same class label as the color. Uh, there are two environments that we consider, uh, one in which this uh, probability of agreement between the, uh, or the disagreement probability between the color and the class label is 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.1 in the other environment. So there is a small change in these uh, uh, probabilities. And then there is a testing environment where the color is anti-correlated with the class label. So any predictor that builds on the color uh, is going to fail in this setting. Uh, so how does our method work here? We compare with uh, just training on all the available data, training on the uh, available data for the first environment, the second environment. This is a robust method that uh, uh, optimizes the largest error uh, across environments. And these are variations of the environment uh, risk minimization method. And in general, we do much better than all those methods. We almost do as well as if you ignore the color and you just train on the uh, images, the original images without the color, which is kind of an upper limit for this method. Um, we test the same the same on a fashion MNIST. It's within the same setting. Now, instead of digits, you have uh, categories of clothes. And here, we are also able to do as well as the, uh, the method that uh, uses just the, the images without the colors. Cool. So this concludes this uh, work, uh, ICAL. It's a method for out of distribution generalization in the nonlinear setting. We assume that the prior distribution for the latent variables, given the label and the environment, is a general exponential family distribution. It guarantees this guarantees that we can identify the true latent variables. Uh, we have done that by extending the IDA theory to from factorized to non-factorized priors. We can then discover the causal latent variables very easily by doing these uh, conditional independence tests. We have also theoretical guarantees for generalization to new environments. I didn't talk about this. The details are in, in the paper. Uh, and we have shown that we can outperform existing baselines in these uh, settings like colored MNIST and uh, fashion MNIST. Uh, yeah, so that's all. Thanks a lot. And uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, let's, yeah, 
Let's open the floor to question for questions. A virtual floor. Good. Before any questions, maybe I can tell you that I'm really excited about this uh, ICAL method uh, because it sounds counterintuitive. No, uh, first that uh, you can identify uh, latent variables that we are used to generate the data with high precision, and then you can actually identify which ones have the a causal uh, effect on the on the targets, uh, which is also quite uh, surprising. Yeah, maybe I can jump in with a with a question on that. Can, can you, the, the first thing you mentioned about being able to actually identify the latent variable, I, I find yeah. it quite uh, quite surprising too. Could you, could you say a bit more about that? What's in this uh, generalized exponential family that uh, make it work, or why is it that we can actually do it? Is there any intuition behind that? Yeah. So the key thing is that uh, you need to have uh, additional variables on which you are going to be conditioning. Uh, if you don't have any of these additional uh, variables on which you condition your prior, there are no identifiability results. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a bit uh, obscure. <laughs> uh, you can look at the, I mean, the, the key thing is to look at the theory for this, uh, but uh, yeah, the idea is that when, when you condition on these uh, latent variables, let me see, if you think about, um, Maybe the way the way this works is that you try to find your, your you estimate the model by maximum likelihood, and uh, you can think that uh, the model is going to be identifiable if you have that two models have the same uh, value of the likelihood, or they, they are they are giving you the same uh, likelihood values for uh, or probability values for different uh, data points. Uh, you can show that. Uh, those models, if they have, if they give you the same probability values for different data points, then uh, you can show that these uh, uh, latent variables would be the same. And the key thing is that uh, there are some constraints that have to be satisfied between these uh, sufficient statistics of the latent variables uh, and uh, these uh, uh, natural parameters in the distribution. And uh, the idea is that there are not so many possible combinations uh, between values of these uh, uh, sufficient statistics and values of the uh, natural parameters of the latent variables that will produce the same fit. So the key thing is that uh, the exponential family distribution prior is going to introduce some uh, constraints uh, into the uh, possible values of the latent variables when you condition on the uh, natural uh, parameters. And uh, this is going to constrain the, the possible values that the latent variables will take. Uh, and in the end, uh, um, yeah, there are not going to be so many flexibility uh, when you fit this model to data. And uh, what is going to happen is that uh, the, the values of the latent variables that you obtain will have to satisfy some constraints. Uh, and those are that they are the same as the ones that we are used to generate the data subject to some permutation of those, but also some uh, linear constraints uh, with respect to these uh, sufficient statistics. You will have a linear equation between the sufficient statistics of the original latent variables and of the uh, estimated latent variables. Mm -hmm. And uh, those those linear constraints are going to be quite simple. Thanks. That was a great uh, insight. Thanks a lot. So when you I have to say that it, it, it's something surprising. So I I mean you can look at the theory of the IV paper. This is like a non-trivial theory, <laughs> and uh, you can show the see the results that they hold in, in practice, and you will get these equalities of uh, linear transformations of the sufficient statistics. But it's a uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's not something that you can directly see. Yeah, I think Carl, you had some question. So in practice, you, you look at, do you look at all pairs of variables? And then... Yeah, so that's uh, one of the things uh, that uh, you will have to estimate these latent variables. And uh, obviously you're not going to have as many as inputs because typically you will assume that there is some uh, low dimensional representation of the data, uh, but you will have to look at these uh, pairs of variables. Um, 
And uh, I mean, if you want to discover the latent variables using this method, which I, we have found that this is the best one that works in practice because it has very few assumptions. I mean, it's just uh, it's conditional independence testing. You can do you can use a kernel method for this, and it works very well. You could think of using other techniques. Uh, I think they don't work as well uh, because there are more assumptions that might not be uh, satisfied by the data. Um, but uh, the good news is that you can do all these tests in parallel. So if you, you will have to do a number of tests that is quadratic in the number of latent variables. So if you have 100 latent variables, this means you will have to do 10,000 tests, but you can do those in parallel. So it's, it's relatively easy to do. And then you have to, then you have to, um, you have to summarize the, out, the outcome right? yeah. because you have to find an explanation. And, and is that easy? Does it, does it easily, does it easily separate into sets of things that are causally related and things that aren't? Or is that, or do you have to kind of mush it together a bit? To, to I mean, we have, uh, yeah, so this is obviously, what we do is we have a threshold and typically you get a, a pair of latent variables and, uh, and obviously the model cannot be perfect. And it may be that uh, the latent variables, uh, your prior assumes uh, independence, no? Uh, but I mean, you all know that if you feed a variational autoencoder model with a Gaussian prior, the latent variables that you recover, recover are not Gaussian. Uh, so you could still have some uh, small amount of dependence between the variables. So what we look is look at the amount of dependence that you have when you condition on Y and A, uh, and the amount of dependence uh, that you have when you don't uh, condition. And uh, uh, if there is, uh, sorry, when you condition on Y, that's, that's the key thing, when you condition on Y. Uh, so if you if you look at the amount of dependence when you condition on Y and when you don't condition on Y, then that that's indicative that uh, those could be causal latent variables. And obviously you have some uh, sensitivity for this, uh, uh, so there is going to be some uh, arbitrary threshold uh, to decide. Uh, but at least we have we have seen that uh, this this works quite well in practice. Uh, let me just trust that uh, the official time is now over. So anyone uh, who would like to uh, sign off, please, uh, please feel free. Uh, and anybody who wishes to stay a while longer for uh, more detailed questions, uh, stick around. Well, in case uh, Jose Miguel has a bit more time on his hand. Yeah, I'm happy to stay a few more minutes if anyone wants to chat. Any further questions? Raise is your this, hand. Is this, or... a, is, this a, is this a pretty unique result? I mean, it, it combines a whole bunch of sort of interesting recent things. I, I wonder, you know, what's the What's the closest people have come to this before? Do you, can... um, so, I mean, this results on, uh, um, I mean, people have, uh, have worked with uh, identifiable VAs uh, before, uh, and then uh, they have also used them for causal inference. Uh, the difference I think is that uh, they didn't really, uh, I mean, those models, they don't, they don't work with this uh, setting of correlations in the prior distribution. So this is uh, completely new. And uh, I don't think they have applied them to this uh, particular setting of a robust prediction. Uh, for example, uh, Harpo, he has, uh, he has worked quite a lot on causal inference with uh, deep generative models. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they have some results on that, but uh, they haven't really applied them to this problem of uh, a robust prediction with several environments. Uh, and uh, yeah, those models they 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 don't uh, they don't uh, uh, have been, they haven't been applied on on detecting these spurious or, or getting the classifiers that are robust uh, to spurious dependencies. I can also say a few words about when this is going to fail. <laughs> uh, obviously things could go wrong if you have, for example, uh, 
confounders in the latent variables. So if you have additional latent variables that introduce dependencies within the latent variables, then uh, this is not going to work because we're assuming that uh, this, uh, this dependency is given the environment, the, the causal latent variables, we assume that they are independent. Uh, and uh, the same for, for the effects. And if you have like a, some hidden confounders, then that's not going to be the case. Um, the other case uh, in which uh, this can fail is that uh, the conditions that guarantee identifiability is that you have a, I mean, there are some conditions that, that require identifiability and I think it's uh, related to these uh, natural parameters and uh, the linear equations that you get. Uh, you will have that some uh, matrices have to be invertible. Uh, so you have to have diversity in the environment variables and in the Y variables that you are conditioning on to guarantee that. Uh, uh, and if that's not the case, then you won't be able to recover the, the true latent variables. Uh, so that's why you need these environments. There is going to be some uh, variation in the variables on which you are conditioning that will allow you to identify these latent variables. Otherwise, you, you won't have uh, those results. And uh, I think this is quite interesting because it's completely different from the theory of uh, invariant risk minimization. The theory on invariant risk minimization, uh, it only works in the case with linear representations and they, it's, not, it's not so uh, at, le at least clearly uh, how, how to determine when things are going to work or not. I'm not sure if I caught it, but uh, how does it compare with methods uh, developed in uh, probabilistic graphical models, uh, Bayesian networks and so on? So there they have uh, some methods for inferring uh, the causal graph, right? Yeah, so you could think of doing, um, I mean, you, you could try, so yeah, yeah that's, that's right. So you could try to, to do this uh, discovery of causal uh, relationships between variables. One of the things here is that the variables are uh, latent. So first you need some method to estimate the latent variables. And uh, for this, you will need the identifiability results, which is not, is not a straightforward to obtain in the nonlinear case. Um, so I think that's probably quite different. Uh, I mean, there are some some people send some work where people estimate some uh, latent variables and then they they use uh, some uh, causal discovery. Uh, for example, like Harpo has been uh, working on this, um, but uh, the models are slightly different. For example, they don't account for these dependencies uh, in the prior distribution that we are uh, accounting for, uh, and they don't apply to this uh, problem of uh, robust prediction. Uh, thanks. Uh, maybe one uh, question on this slide. On the step two here, the latent variables are estimated using the target or just using the... Yeah, use the target and the environment because uh, uh, so you need the... So you need to learn a variational autoencoder model uh, where the prior is this one. It's a conditional prior and you are conditioning on the observed label and on the observed uh, environment variable. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have another question about, about, the, about the first uh, part of the talk. I was just wondering how, uh, whether there are any relations with the uh, regularization, uh, the MC dropout and ensembles, because in some ways when you're identifying subnetworks, what you're doing, it's, well, at least superficially, it seems like what you're doing, it's regular, regularizing. Uh, the network, so it's it, obviously uh, it's, MC dropout. Yeah. You kind of do it randomly, so probably there is a way to do it in a smarter fashion. Uh, which so is... it's a, a slightly it's a slightly slightly different uh, because our, what we do is not really related to regularization. I agree that the uh, Monte Carlo dropout and all that they will enforce some regularization. The main difference with this method is that you just train your neural network in any way that you want, and you will get some point estimate of the parameters. And uh, in that sense, we don't really introduce any additional regularization in the model. The only difference is that uh, when we make predictions with the model, uh, we are going to use as a, an initial value for those predictions, the output of the deterministic model. But then we are going to say, 
there are going to be some deviations with respect to those predictions, and those deviations will be related to the uncertainty from the subnetwork weights. Uh, so if you look at this, the point, uh, the continuous line uh, in blue is actually the same in, uh, in all the models because the, the, the deterministic predictions are the same and we only look at deviations uh, uh, from those. Um, so the method with the full covariance matrix, uh, the method with the diagonal covariance matrix, and then with the subnetworks, and the map estimation, they all have the same uh, uh, mean for the predictions, which is given by this point estimate model. This is very good because I mean you could have very many network, many methods to train your neural networks so that you get very accurate predictive performance, and then uh, you just uh, add some uncertainty to the output of the of that method based on this uh, technique. Great, thanks. Good. Maybe if we, if we don't have for any... This, I, that, that, so for this method, do you, um, in the big network you applied it to, you have about 50,000 weights that you... Yeah, it's, so, yeah this, we keep uh, 42,000. Yeah. And so, that, so that's, quite a good, that's quite a big covariance matrix. Yeah, it's a big covariance matrix. And then uh, you could imagine how, what's the effect of this. Uh, maybe you could go to a smaller covariance matrices. And actually, I have some results for that <laughs> that I was keeping uh, at the end. Uh, so this shows results with a smaller covariance matrices. So you have here for 40K is the one that we were using. And the uh, performance degrades as you decrease uh, the size of this. However, it doesn't really degrade uh, as much as to uh, still be worse than the deep ensembles. For example, you can see here that with the uh, 3,000 uh, weights, which is a relatively small covariance matrix, uh, we are still doing much better than the deep ensembles. And in this case uh, here, I think uh, also with 3000 weights uh, for this cipher 10, uh, we are still doing better uh, than deep ensembles. We get closer to deep ensembles because performance deteriorates, but then it's still better. Right, so to get the full effect out of the me method, you kind of you need to to have some big matrices around it. Yeah, so that's also another thing, the cost of this method. So yeah. if you want to make predictions, then you will have this covariance matrix. And whenever you make a prediction, you have to make a, a product of a vector times that covariance matrix. And that's going to have this extra cost. But so it's, this possible, be, yeah. it's possible that you could represent the, the final output of the network in, 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 a, in, a, in a different way, for example. Like, because you can make predictions, like then you, like, yeah, I can imagine many settings, people have tried to train another network to represent. Yeah, that's right. You could you could think of doing something like that, yeah. uh, trying to amortize the computation of this uncertainty. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I think we'll have to thank uh, Jose Miguel now. Uh, you're very grateful for the additional time. Um, Good. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you.